Okay, we're ready to go. Open your Bibles, if you would, to chapter 8 of Romans, and we'll continue on, and we'll, we'll get into it, head over heels here. You know, it's hard to jump in the middle of this again, because you need to take this, as it goes through it, it builds one thing upon another upon another, you know. And, and so far, Paul has literally told us, we're the dirt of the earth. And not only us, but Jews also. All of us, we all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And then he's talking about even himself, all the things that he would want to do, he doesn't still do them all. One of the things he doesn't want to do, he still does some of those things. You know, and how, how is he, who's going to save us from this wretched body? But then he gives us the clue, Christ Jesus, you know, is the one. Now, in verse 8, when we start out there, it starts out in verse 1. And it says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And, you know, there's a little bit of controversy about, you know, is after the flesh, but after the spirit. It, it, that was an add on, they say, to some of it. It'll go on and it exactly fits. I'm just telling you, it's the truth. Whether or not it was in the original or not, I wasn't there. I didn't write it. I don't know. But I'm telling you it's the truth. If you, if you walk after the flesh, well, let's just go on and read it because Paul pretty well just really lays it out for us. In verse 2, it says, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. So the law... Of, there's a law in Jesus Christ. Paul has is, is really brought us to that point. We know that there's a law of righteousness. If you are righteous, God has set up the things that he himself, by law, will do. He'll receive you. He'll receive anybody. It doesn't make any difference if you're righteous. Now, what do I mean by that? The Father in heaven sent the Son to die in our place so that we could be righteous before him. You see, Everyone that comes in before him, must they must be righteous. Why? Because he's a consuming fire of holiness. If you're not as holy as he is holy, you'll start to smell the smoke. And the next thing you'll realize is you're burning up. And then you end up being a grease spot on the floor. Why? Because his holiness consumes sin. He, that's why he couldn't just bring us home to heaven and say, I love you guys, my creation, come on home. Well, that would just be one big fire in the fireplace, you know, and it would be us. You have to be as holy as God is holy and as righteous as he is righteous. And how is that accomplished? Only one way. And that's your belief in Jesus Christ. Then the third part of the Trinity of God, the Holy Spirit, somehow, and I have no idea how, but you become born again as a spiritual man in Christ Jesus. And Jesus has paid the penalty for all your sins. You then get to put on his robe of righteousness. His robe. Righteous. You can stand before his Holy Father. Jesus has been before him forever, eternity, wearing that robe. Your robe of righteousness is his robe of righteousness. Your holiness is his holiness you'll be able to be before the Father for eternity. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that cool? Can you stand there in your own robe of righteousness? I wouldn't try it, okay? He just wouldn't try it. Yours, there, well, the Lord kind of said there is no good thing in us whatsoever, and he meant our righteousness in that. It goes on, Paul writes in 3, then he says, for what the law could not do, he says, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, he says, for sin condemns sin in the flesh. You know, okay, that's kind of a tongue twister. Let's, let's just break it apart and, and look at it for just a moment here. The law, remember we talked about it was like a thermometer. And where the righteousness of Christ, him dying for us on the cross, is like, like a thermostat. A thermometer can't do anything about the heat, it just tells you what it is. A thermostat can do something about it. It turns on the air conditioner, it cools down the air around you. And the, the law, it just told us that we were sinners, but it, it couldn't help us beyond that point. But then it says God sending his own son in the likeness, not in flesh, sinful flesh, but in the likeness of sinful flesh. Well, if it wasn't sinful flesh, what does it mean, the likeness? 
Well, it means that he had everything that our bodies would have. It had the blood vessels. It had the, the you know all the nervous system. It has the everything about it. He had his own set of fingerprints. Wouldn't that be something to get the fingerprints of Jesus? Boy, that'd be something, wouldn't it? But it but understand it was in the likeness. Why was it in the likeness? He didn't have sin nature polluting his flesh. We have sin nature that pollutes our flesh continuously all the time, ever since we were little bitty tots. You know, it, it, we, we grew up in the nature of sin and all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, except Jesus. But he became our sin. He became my sin. I just, you know, it's, it's strange how that you go through the Bible, you go through the Bible, you teach it, teach it, teach it, and then things just keep popping out new things. That's not like new in the Bible, it's just new to me. And I think it's part of it is how dumb we really are, and I am, and then I see something as simple as this, and all of a sudden I'm going, how come I never stopped and thought about this before? I was doing the part of the scripture where that Jesus came to John the Baptist and was baptized for remission of sin. He didn't have any sin. If he was baptized and allowed himself to be baptized saying for remission of my sin, that would be a lie. Would it not? If he was baptized for sin and he didn't have any sin? Gee, he must have had some. Well, we know he was sinless. Then all of a sudden, duh, it hit on me, and I stopped and thought about, when did he start taking my place? He started t when he started his ministry. His ministry started at the age of 30 years old, baptized by John the Baptist, and he came in, and John says, John was thinking like I was thinking, wait a minute, I, I can't be baptizing you, you should be baptizing me. And Jesus said, no, no, I, I need to be baptized by you. Why? Because I'm, I'm Merle now. I'm taking his place. You see, this is how all humans should walk, the way I'm going to walk in my ministry. Obedient to the Father. That's what all human beings should have been. And he then was immediately tested in that. That's, that's, that's an awesome part to me. All of a sudden I realized and I said, wait a minute, I always thought he became me at the cross. You know, as they were nailing him to the cross, he said, I'll take on the sins of all the people of the world. No, he was carrying all those throughout his whole ministry. That was his ministry, was to come in our place and die for us, to pay the penalty. But he had to prove how it should have been walked with us, even as that man. You notice it says here, for sin condemned sin in the flesh. Yeah, he became, walked in my place, but he still never sinned once he became me. Isn't that interesting? He was tempted in all ways. Immediately you'll find that right after that baptism, he was sent into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit and empowered by the Holy Spirit and tempted of the devil for 40 days. But he never sinned. Just like you and I, now that we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, we can be tempted. We should never sin. But if you do, you have an advocate in heaven. But you shouldn't. We should always be striving to say no to sin. Why? Because there's a law. We just read that. There's a law about sin. But there's also a law of righteousness. We should be walking in that law. In verse 4 it says, For that righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. The righteousness of the law. The law of the Old Testament? Yes. Why is that? He betook on our place, we get to take his place. Christ Jesus fulfilled the law. Just like he took my place and became sin, we end up being born again in his righteousness. We get the fulfillment of the law through him. Isn't that interesting? But we walk, he says, not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Verse 5 then, it goes on and says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. Otherwise, your whole thoughts, your whole way of life, everything you live for is all about the flesh and things down here. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit, that you spend your whole time, yeah, you have to work down here, you live down here, but what's your thoughts on? Well, getting this done for the Lord, getting this done so we can go to heaven, getting this done as the way the Lord would have us do it. Your whole thoughts are on the things of the Spirit. Your, Jesus took 
on his ministry at 30 years old. He died three years later. He walked perfect for three years in, in this, all this temptation in the world just like we did. He was perfect up to that time and never sinned. But he also walked taking on our humanity and the humanity of the whole world for all the time of his ministry, being tempted in every way, shape, and form by, by every temptation the devil could throw at him. And he never sinned. He says, for the carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Interesting. Carnal minded is death. To be spiritual minded is to be peace. Is to be peace. You have life and peace. Even if you're in the storms down here. See, I, Jesus is our example. Was he, did he lose his peace on the cross? He had just been beaten. He had just been scourged. He had been you know, slapped around, his beard pulled out. He had been nailed to a cross. But we never see him lose his peace. Why? Because he was spiritual minded. He's our example. It's interesting. I read Fox's books of martyrs, early church history, you know, people who martyred their lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. And one thing that you note through every one of them is the peace that they have. Nobody likes dying, especially the way they died. But they had a peace because they were at peace with God. And their eyes were set on where they're going for eternity. And they, were knew, they knew they were at peace with the one who held eternity in their hands, in his hand. They were at peace. Even in the midst of where we're at right now in this life, in this country we live in, in all the calamity and turmoil and, and awful wicked things that's happening around us, we should be at peace. <coughs> peace. Because we know that we're at peace with God. We should know that. In verse 7 it says, Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. That means wars against him. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. Why is it that we get so taken and shocked when people who don't know God and can only live in the flesh because that's all they know is the flesh and the flesh is sinful and they do terrible, wicked, sinful things and it shocks us. Why? They can't do anything but that. Now, a lot of them restrain themselves and they're not as wicked as some. Terrible things that happen. What is shocking to me is when born-again Christians do terrible, wicked things. Now, that's something they get shocked over. Why? They have a new nature. They don't have to. They have the power of the Holy Spirit to say no to sin. Why then? That's the part that upsets and bothers me. Especially if it's me that's doing it. <laughs> You know, why did I do that, I think? I didn't have to do that. I know better, you know. I shouldn't talk to my wife like that. I should just say, yes, ma'am. <laughs> Verse 8, so then they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh. He says, but in the spirit, you're in the spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if any man has not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. You know, this is getting down to the nitty gritty. It isn't what you say, but God's going to look at what you do, and man has to really look at the fruit of your life to see, are they really Christians or not? They say they have God. They say they have the Holy Spirit. But the only way we can tell, because we haven't, got, we haven't in invented that x-ray machine that looks in the heart and sees whether or not you're born again or not. We haven't invented that one yet. So we have to go by what kind of fruit does your tree produce? Does it produce the fruit of the Spirit? Or does it produce the fruit of the devil? That's all we can go by. Bad fruit, good fruit. 
and one tree can't grow both in the same place. Now, after the grafting, it should be good fruit. Before the grafting, it's probably going to be bad fruit. That's the way it should be. In 10, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit of life, he says, because the spirit is alive or has life because of righteousness. So the body should be dead and the spirit should be alive. But if the spirit, verse 11, of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Well, what does he mean by that? I, I like it this way. Before you knew Christ, there is no doubt your spirit was not in control of your life. Your flesh was. Your body. You get up in the morning, your body says, I'm hungry, eat. You know, I want this, go get it for me. You know, <laughs> that kind of thing. But after you're born again, your spirit becomes alive and your spirit now has strength and it rises up and the Holy Spirit is merged with it. It should be telling your body what to do and when to do it and how it wants it done. Your body says, no, we always do it like this. Your spirit should say, no, we used to do it like that and we're not going to do it that way anymore. We're going to do it this way. We used to growl at the kids. Now we're going to smile at the kids. We used to be bitter and nasty towards people. Now we're going to be kind and gentle towards people. Because why? Now we have a new nature, and our spirit has to be in control. But does your flesh want to give up easy? No. Paul tells us he had to buffet his flesh every day. That means smack it around and show it who's boss. The spirit now is strong. Why? Because you have the God of the universe living inside of you to strengthen your spirit, to do righteousness, to do holiness, to do things of goodness. And so you need your spirit needs to stand up and take control of your body. And your body, it's never going to give up wanting its way till the day your spirit leaves it. And then it finds out it can't live on its own. It just falls down to the ground. But right now it thinks that it's really the life and it should be in control. And so there's this war going back and forth all the time. Therefore, in verse 12, he says, brethren, he says, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. You don't owe your flesh anything. He's what got you in trouble to start with. He has the sin nature in him. You don't owe him nothing. He says, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the, of the body, you shall live. Mortify? Well, just think of morticians. The word mortify means literally to embalm it, <laughs> you know, to make sure it's dead. Even though you're still wearing it, you don't have to worry. Well, how will I? Well, the Lord will quicken it through the spirit. You just make sure it's dead. Okay, in verse 14, it says, for as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Interesting. I, sometimes I get a little bit taken by these terms. I'm sorry, my mind works in weird ways. We all have to become the bride of Christ. That means us guys got to be girls, in a sense. We have to learn to submit like girls and, and did, like my perfect wives and your, you know. But notice this here. You guys, you girls, have to learn to be sons of God. Well, what does this tell us? Well, one thing for sure, don't get hung up into this male and female thing that's only here on this earth. Your spirit has no male or female. Your spirit, spirit. How that really works and everything, I don't know yet. I'll tell you when I get there. But you're just playing a role with your body here on this earth and your emotions and everything else. It's a role you're playing. But, yeah, you were assigned that. You didn't get to choose it, okay? But here we're going to be sons of God. That means literally in his family. It's the adoption. It's the paperwork. It's the, uh, it's the legalistic part of you're going to be there righteously and justified. You're not the neighbor kid just hanging out next door. You know, because no neighbor kids are going to hang out next door in heaven. 
so they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. Would you say that we as humans are kind of fearful? Yeah, I would say that. I, you know, uh, I can remember very, being very afraid of the dark, you know, when I was a child. Um, I mean, more so than normal. Am I afraid of the dark now? No, because I know what lurks out there, but I also know what is in me. He is stronger in me than is in the world. So I'm not, I'm not, I've lost that fear when in Christ Jesus. But it's not a bondage. You, you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. When you, if you would have been a slave and owned by a master and sold to another master, you'd still be a slave and you'd still be fearful. It's just a different master, different name. What we're going to find out is you weren't sold. You, you were redeemed and our new, our father in heaven didn't, he isn't our master and we're the slave, though we we are the servants, too, as a child grows up. He's a servant before he becomes, you know, older in the house. But he's our father. It's an adoption. The masters didn't adopt the slaves normally. They just owned them, and they controlled them. We are being adopted into the family. Much comes with that, and much is, it had to be given for that to happen. He says, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. When Jesus was present on the earth and they said, teach us how to pray. You pray all the time. How should we pray? And he says, pray like this. Our Father, all those Jews stepped back and said, what? We're going to call Yahweh our Father? How can this be? He's Yahweh. He's the God of heaven and of earth. He's the creator of all. And we're going to call him Daddy? <laughs> Abba? Daddy? How can this be? Jesus said, because that's what I call him. And you're going to be in me. I call him Daddy. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that something? Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. In 16, it says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Not the slaves of God. Not even anymore the creation of God. We're not the children of Adam anymore. We're not under the law of sin because we were born into it anymore. We are now adopted into God his righteous, holy family. It used to just be three. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And now you. Isn't that awesome when you think about that? He never had any other children. Now he has you. Isn't that awesome? Wow. Children of God. 17 it says, and if children, then you're heirs. You see, if you'd have just been a slave purchased, you have no rights to anything. But he adopted you, and in that adoption comes full rights. You have as much rights as, as any natural-born child. And God had one, the only begotten one, Jesus. You have now, being adopted in, full rights right along with Jesus. Because why? You're in him. You're in Christ Jesus. Wow, isn't that awesome? Then are your heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, whoops, let's scratch that part out. We like the heir part. We like being with him, going to get everything's fine. I, but we don't like to suffer with him. But understand this, that's where it starts is at the cross, isn't it? It starts in death. His death your death to self. That's where it starts. You suffer with him that we might be also glorified together. You can't be glorified like Jesus was glorified and raised from the dead unless you're in the dead with him. Then you're glorified also into newness of life. You can't become born again without dying first. 
you can't be born born. You can only be born again if you quit being the firstborn living that life. You have to die. Does that make sense? You, a, a person can't live again until they're through living the first one. You have to die first to live again. I, you know, it just really makes sense. You can't live again after you're still living the first one. You, don't, you can't live the second one. It doesn't work that way. You must die to self in, with Christ, die in Christ to be resurrected with him. When we baptize, that's what we tell people. The, it's not, believe me, the water, I guarantee you'll get one thing, wet. That you'll get. But it's in likeness. It's like his went burial into the grave when I put you down. Now, if you're lucky, I won't make you wait three days before I bring you back up. See? And some of us, it'll take that long to get rid of our sins. But when Christ came back up, he didn't bring our sins back up with him. Did you notice that? You're not supposed to bring them back up with you either. You're supposed to come up in newness of life. What's that newness of life? New nature. New, whole new you, a new creation in Christ Jesus. Something happens spiritual in the spiritual world that you, when you die in Christ, you really do somehow or other. And the Holy Spirit gives you a newness. You became a whole new creature. How that works? I don't know. Ask God when you get there. We don't, know how, we don't even know what causes life. We do. We know it's Jesus that lights all men that comes into the world. But, they, they, you know, these are technical things that we just don't have all those answers to yet. I'm just telling you, it works. You're born again. You're newness of life. You're a new creation. You're not the old man. But I still look in the mirror and it looks like me. No, you got his body on, but it's not you in there. It's a different you inside now. And, and he says, yeah, but I look like him. I ought to act like him. No, no, no. Make him act different. You're the spirit. You're in control. Make him act, act different. That's what Paul's trying to tell us. We shouldn't live like the old man anymore. We should live like the new man, our new creation. In 18, it says, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Notice that, in us. Whatever sufferings you go through in this world, you're, you, you, you either, how do I say this? The truth of the matter is, even no matter what happens to your body, it really is only through electric waves or whatever else, you feel it in your head. You think you feel it. That's why... People who lose an arm still feel their hands hurt, even though they don't have one anymore. And the whole arm's gone, their hand hurts, because it's, it's in your head. And the, the truth of the matter is, is that uh, anything you suffer down here, whether it be mental anguish or whether it be physical anguish or everything else, it's just, it's all in your mind. It, well, it really happens to your body, but it's because of electric waves and everything else, it's really all in your mind. But when you get up there, it's, you're going to get so a new body that's going to be so fantastic and the abilities and the freedom from all temptation and all sin and everything else. What he's saying here, whatever you could possibly suffer here, the moment you get receive that new glorified body and you receive that, you're standing in heaven, you will, have, you will be the first one to say, it was well worth it, no matter what it was that you suffered down here. And you haven't even started your eternity yet. It's just you just got there. But it will be worth everything that could happen. Paul says it this way. He says, this is like a vapor. Have you, have you, you know, you know what a vapor is. That's when you a piece a smoke or something and you watch it and it just dissipates and gone. It, it's just a vapor. It's gone. It's like steam. Steam comes off the kettle and you watch it for a minute and then you wonder where to go. It's gone. It disappears. 19, it says, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. When God created the earth, he already knew you. He knew you before he calmed the waters and aligned them to make dirt. And out of that dirt, he was going to make the first human being. He already knew you. He knew your nature. He knows everything about you. He knew your thoughts would be today. He knows what your thoughts are tomorrow. All of those things. He's God. That's what makes him so special. You know, he's just fantastic. But the whole reason he did this whole, I'll call it a fiasco, 
was because he wanted you with him in eternity, not as a robot, but as a free-willed creature chose to be like him. And he'll then bestow blessings forever on you because you chose to be with him. And you had a choice. His whole thing has had to be set up so that every human being has a choice. You choose God or you choose to live for self in the flesh in this world, the devil. Whichever one, there's only two fathers. There's a heavenly father and the father of the devil, as Jesus told the Pharisees at that time. I know your father is. You're going to live eternity with your father. You get to choose which one. You were born with this one, so it's natural to go to hell with him. But God said, I've made a way that you can be adopted, and I'll be your father, and you can go with me. But you have to choose to do so. The greater choice is to quit doing what you naturally do and what you already have and to go with something new and different and trust him. See, that's called faith. You know, and Paul's going to talk about that in just a minute here to us. Things that are seen, not seen, rather. In 20, it says, for the creature was made subject to vanity and not willingly. He's not willing. Why? Did you have a choice when you were born? No. Okay. He says, by, he says but by reason of him who has subject, subjected the same in hope, otherwise give you in hope, he says, because of the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into a glorious liberty, the children of God. He made the way, and from the very beginning, you go back, first man, Adam, Eve, sin, God talked to him that day and give him the salvation plan. Remember, right along with the curse. The earth will be cursed, and you'll work by this, all that and everything else, but the, the seed of this woman will come, and, the, and he shall have his heel bruised, but he's going to stomp on the head of, of, of sin itself. You know, the whole salvation plan. And then he, God didn't tell them this, but it's really kind of neat to find out the names of their children and everybody. For the first 10 people, their, the meanings of their name gives you the whole salvation plan. It's fantastic. God, from the very beginning, had this plan set out. I heard it, somebody said the other day, well, he tried to work with, you know, with uh, humanity, and that didn't work. So then he, he tried to work with, uh, he made a nation of his own called Israel, and, and he worked with them for about 2,000 years, and that didn't work either. So then he, 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 he got Jesus to come, and then we did this, you know, and I went, are you kidding me? It's like God's trial and error through this whole thing. Give me a break. I mean, this is a God that knows of the last human being that will be born on this earth. God already knows all of his thoughts and knew him before he even created the earth. That's the kind of God we're dealing with here. Uh, he's, he's majestic. And this isn't a trial and error thing. God knows exactly how this will end up. He knows exactly where it's going and everything. And he said a perfect way he had you in mind to be born in, in Acts in the 17th chapter, I think it is, that Paul says to King Agrippa, he says, we're all born of one blood in one nation, born within these times and within this bounds that we might grope and find God. So God picked the best time of all humanity for you with your personality and your makeup and had you born within that time, the best time ever that you would get saved. It's It's unbelievable. You say, well, how can he do that? He's got, he can do anything he wants. He just picks your parents. God works from the back to the front. It, it's, it's an awesome thing. How do I know that? Because he says, Jeremiah, I, I knew you. I webbed you together. I created you in your mother's womb. You know, he says that about David. I have, I have one who is after my own heart that I'm, I'm forming over here. <laughs> I'm working with him. He's a man after my own heart. How, how, did, that, how did God know that? See? Because he, he creates him. You and I. We, we, God knew that you were going to choose him because God knows everything. Because he knew that you were going to choose him at this point in your life, God then called you from the very beginning and made sure everything was set up that when you did choose him, you, you know, you seek me, you'll find me. You'll, he makes it because he knew you would. Isn't that awesome? But he also knew 
Why do you think Judas was chosen to be one of the twelve? God also knew that no matter what, having Jesus in his own presence, having three years walk with him, doing miracles, having send him out and having people healed through his hands and cast out, wasn't enough. There was nothing that God could do short of making a robot out of Judas Iscariot in order to make him a born-again believer. So he was chosen to be one of the twelve. Why? Son of perdition. Had to be someone. God chose someone, there was no chance of salvation for him. Why? Because he knew, no matter what God did, short of making him a robot, he wasn't going to believe. He was so self-centered, so about himself. But the wonderfulness of it is, he knew we would. God says, I love those that love me. Isn't that awesome? When you think about that, 22, for we know that the whole creation groaneth. Yeah, you ever been around an earthquake? Believe me, it groans before you feel the jolt. I'm telling you, I've been in a bunch of them, and it groans. I remember one night I was sleeping, and, and this huge earthquake came, and I just happened to be in charge of this whole power plant and lost was actually in Long Beach, California, and, and I was the supervisor on duty, and we were allowed, we had bunks there and whatever, and because we only worked when it was emergencies. And I'm sound asleep, and all of a sudden, this terrible noise, and I'm inside of a, a, a facility that's got 10-foot cyclone fencing with barbed wire all across the top of it. The gates have cameras on it, and they're all electronically on it. I mean, we're isolated inside of this power plant thing. And all of a sudden, there's noise, and I'm going, what is that? Just, I mean, it was a terrible noise. And then all of a sudden, you talk about fireworks, all those transformers and capacitors blowing up and going everywhere, and I'm going, I think I'll go home. <laughs> I don't mind getting paid when I don't have to work, but this is going to be ridiculous. But it was, it groans. It, the earth groans, it says, and, and travaileth in pain together until now the whole creation. Why? The curse covered everything in the garden. That stupid act of Adam and Eve that God knew was going to happen, but that stupid act, I can't use the word stupid. I've got to quit saying stupid because we found out stupid is a bad word to say in the Spanish community. So I don't mean it to be bad and don't mean offense by it. I mean it to be dumb. That act that we had there through Adam and Eve not only did, because everything had been given to them as dominion, that means everything in their hands had to be cursed. And they had been given dominion of the fish, the birds, the earth itself, all the animals. It had to be cursed. And the earth would say, and the birds would say, what did we do? <laughs> we didn't do nothing. <laughs> yeah, well, so be it. But if they want to be restored the earth itself wants to be restored remember the earth had to bring forth briars and thistles the earth didn't want to do that they wanted to bring forth fruit trees and grain and and lush for everything that the earth wanted to be accommodating why because god made it and everything was remember he said good the earth was good and then he, God tells it, now you have to bring forth briars and thistles. Oh, we don't want to do that. Hedge trees. Oh, my. The whole earth groaneth. And 23, it says, and not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, he says, to wit, the redemption of our body. And, you know, there is times I groan. And probably the most of that, is my wife would tell you is five o'clock in the morning when I have to get out of bed. That's when you hear the moaning and the groaning out of me because it hurts. I used to wonder, why does old people walk like that? They walk like that because they hurt. I found out when they got older, you know, to get up and get on your feet, your ankles hurt, your knees hurt, you know, to stand up straight. You're not sure if you can. And, you know, it's just I moan and groan. I'm looking forward to a new body a new glorified body that won't have pain that will won't have stiffness oh it'll be fantastic and 24 says we he says are saved by hope he says but hope that is seen is not hope for what a man seeth why does he yet hope for it he says but if we hope for that we see not 
is then do we with patience wait for it you know there's there's it's amazing to me how many things in my life i can look back on there was a period of time that i was hoping for something and most of it when i was in the flesh it was all fleshly things i was hoping for you know you you hope for as a as a kid you 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 hope to uh for a car you know when you turn 16 and you hope for um wealth and a job and you hope for it and you hope and for a, a wife that's beautiful and is willing to take care and serve you all the none of those things ever happen you know you get <laughs> and, but hope you know you have hope and you settle then for what you get you know and and uh but now in christ jesus what's our hope no hope for cars anymore my wife tells me i better not be hoping for another wife you know i better not be hoping for riches and glory down here because that's going to make my dad in heaven a little upset what are you hoping for and you don't want to be hoping for a mansion in heaven don't don't hope to be down on the ground floor where the streets are paved with gold so you can go out at night and chip up some what are you hoping for in heaven Really, have you really thought about it? What is your desire in heaven? To see him as he really is. To know him. When I look back at the patriarchs, those that got the closest to him, he says, I speak to Moses as a man speaks to his friend face to face. And what did he want to do? See his glory. Didn't care about anything else. He wanted to see his glory. Guys, when we get to heaven, your hope ought to be down here now is to be able to look into the eyes of God and see his glory. That's what we're hoping for. Your hope, what else are you hoping for? To know him. Isn't that awesome when you think about that? In 26, it says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we, now, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. What does that mean? It means he understands I'm still a box of dirt, and I still am going to make mistakes. For instance, I might be praying, Lord, you know, I need a nicer, newer car that runs better and cheap so I can go to Bible studies. And the Holy Spirit says, okay, let me interpret that in, into heaven for you. Father, he's put on a little extra weight. We need to break his car down so he has to walk to a few Bible studies. He'll lose that weight. That's Moanings and groanings and interpretations that I'm going, yeah, whatever the Holy Spirit said, yeah. The Holy Spirit says, yeah. <laughs> you see, sometimes we ask to mist on our own selfishness, self-centeredness, and things we don't even need, things that really wouldn't be good for us. And, and the Holy Spirit only wants for you what is good for you, nothing else. But what's good for you may be lacking something here on this earth to get caught up in it so that you can spend eternity not having to regret the time you spent down here caught up into something. You know, uh, and, and, and you just have to, your own life, stop and think. How many times did you think for sure that this would be the best thing in your, you could, but it never happened. Now, if it was the best thing and it really was God, it would have happened. But when you get past it and you look back on it, sometimes we look back and go, oh, I'm sure glad that didn't happen. Ooh, now that I know this up here, ooh, boy. And I was asking for that back there. You know? Wow. <laughs> I can remember when I had two churches. And my prayer was always, Lord, if I could just have, you know, a couple hundred, 400 people, you know, that would be great. Now that I'm past that, I look back and I go, are you kidding me? I love what I do now. I hated, 
I hated the controversy that came up in the churches all the time. I don't like the trim. I don't like the color. I don't, these chairs are uncomfortable. I think you should not talk for an hour. I think you should only talk for 10 minutes. I don't think you should talk about the end of the world because, you know, that bothers, I sell insurance and I, you know, and, you know, and all this stuff and you're trying to please everybody, you know, so you end up with a, a plaid carpet, you know, it's got all the colors in it. <laughs> no. I'm so grateful I'm here doing what I do now. Why? I feel at peace, all right? Better move on. It can't be uttered, it says in 27. And he that searches the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. You see, that's the important part, according to the will of God. Uh, not my will, but his will, according to the will of God. And sometimes I get them mixed up. Whose will are we after here? Because my heart deceives me, and it'll say, oh, this is what God wants for you. And I'll go, oh, really? <laughs> Can we check this out with the Lord? No, you don't have to do that. Just trust me. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay. 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purposes. You know, all things work for good. You mean when bad things happen to me, it's for good. I've noticed in my life, probably not so in you guys, but I've noticed in my life that when bad things happen, I pray a lot more. When good things are really going great for me, I have this tendency to kind of just go with it. Hmm. Maybe that's why a lot of Bad things happen to Christians. I don't know. Maybe. He says in 29, For whom he did foreknow. He did foreknow you. He also did predestine to be conformed. Conformed. Remember, just think of like a mold and something's poured into it. You have to fit. Conformed to the image of his son. Now, he's not talking about well, how tall was he? I don't know if I want to be that tall and how fat, you know, and whatever. No, he's talking about in personality, in his thoughts, in his motives, in his actions of his heart. You're going to be conformed into that. Granted, he's not through yet, but every now and then, do you feel the squeeze? It's like, I always picture it's like the, the diamond cutter, you know, uh, you take a rough piece of coal and you make this pressure and heat and you make this beautiful rock. But somebody has to chip off and cut off to make the fats that's beautiful so they reflect the light. And every now and then I feel the chisel, <laughs> you know. And, and sometimes I'm going like, I'm sure glad I'm, I'm, I'm made into a diamond. He says, well, not all of you yet. And then you start feeling the heat and the pressure in a certain area of your life something that has to be a little more faceted into Christ. We're going to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn amongst many brethren. Jesus, whatever he is, we're going to be like him, not in your looks, not in your, your own DNA, not in your own fingerprints and everything else, but in, your, in his mannerism. For instance, Jesus give us that example. It, it, the words that I speak to you, they're not my words. It's what I heard my father say. The actions I do, it isn't me doing it. It's what he does. You know, it was the Holy Spirit through him. He give us that example. When you get to heaven, you'll think you'll have the mind of Christ. It says you'll have the mind of Christ. You'll think like he thinks. You'll act like he acts. You'll love like he loves. I, Believe me, when you, I could get off into this, and I do sometimes in my own thoughts, and I get to thinking, I don't know how this is going to work up there, that I'm going to love everybody up there except me. But everybody else up there is loving me, and they're not loving their self most. Now, how is that really going to work? Because I'll care more how you're comfortable and that you've got plenty to eat and everything else, and I'll never think about me. But all of you are worried about me. Now, how's that going to work? 
I always, Joan says, you know, I love you. And I said, that's what we have in common because I love me too. You know, in the flesh, you know, <laughs> we're like-minded. But it's like, when you get to heaven, I won't be able to say that because it won't be true. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Okay, he's the firstborn amongst and many brethren. You sisters, I don't know. And 30, moreover, whom he did predestine, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Boy, that's a lot of it, isn't it? Okay. He knew how you were going to be, so he called you. And then he, so he, then he predestined you at a certain time to come and everything. Then he justified you just as if you'd never sinned. How does that? Well, he paid the penalty for all your sins. And then so your sins were all paid for, and you just as if you never sinned. He's going to glorify you. Glorify? We have no idea what that means because we've never been there. Be glorified? Jesus left his glory in heaven. He already had glory, came to the world, went back, and, was, and picked back up his glory with the Father. And it was the most glorious act that had ever done in the spiritual realm. All things were given to him. That's the kind of glory we're going to step into. You see, you don't get the Father's glory, you get Jesus' glory, and all glory was given to him. It's going to be strange. It's weird. We have no idea what that's like. No idea. 31. And what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Well, that's obvious. When you think about a God who, before he even creates a world, knows your thoughts way down here, 6,000 years later amongst how many generations of people, yeah, who's going to stop him? He's going to do anything he wants to do. Okay, what's wonderful about it is, though, that he's just, he's, he's justice. He doesn't do anything that isn't right. He's good. He's perfect. Aren't you glad? What if he was mean? Ooh. 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? You need, and I need to really think about that one for a long time. He gave his son up for me. Did he get a good deal? He thinks he did. That's, that's sobering. 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. When you get to heaven, if there was 20 Satans, 50,000 million devils, you couldn't be accused of one single thing. That's how perfect you'll be. They couldn't find a flaw in you. When God gets through, it will be perfect with you 34 who is he that condemneth is it christ that died yea rather that is risen again who is even at the right hand of god who also makes intercession for us why because we're not finished work yet we're not finished work but you will be he will finish that that he's starting you till the day of christ jesus you will be finished in 35, it says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, shall distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? All these things, think about it. We have records of martyrs in the church that each of that individually have gone, this kind of stuff's happened. They didn't deny Christ. If you're chosen to be that kind of a martyr in these end days, you won't deny him either. You'll be strengthened by the Holy Spirit and in that hour given what to say and what to do. It's awesome. Who, who can come against the will of God? Now, it's interesting. 
Remember, you by free choice have given your free will over to do this because your free will could have stopped all of this from happening. You could have chosen not to go with God. Isn't that interesting? That's scary to me that that much responsibility was put in my hands. What if I'd have made the wrong choice? I have over certain things. What if I'd have made the wrong choice in life? Boy, isn't that interesting? Aren't you glad that God's working in the midst of all this too? He says, because I saw in your heart that glimmer. You would choose me, so I'll make sure you get there. I'll call you. I'll elect you. I'll justify you. I'll glorify you. Isn't that awesome? 36, as it is written, for, the, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Not because we're something wonderful, but through him that loved us. We'll be more than conquerors. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, or depths, or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, believe me, he has covered the whole realm. There is nothing left. Isn't that awesome when you think about that? Nothing can separate you from the love of Christ Jesus our Lord. Wow. Chapter 9, verse 1. Next week, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the time we've had in your word today. Lord, it should give us joy in our hearts for you, for what you've done for us. And then at the same time, Lord, it should encourage us to be strengthened by your Holy Spirit that we not disappoint you in days to come. We praise you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.